Hey everybody, it's Dan, your friendly fishmonger at dancefish.com, and today I'm sitting in front of a tank, a beautiful epistogramma. We have a bunch of species of epistogramma to show you. All the ones that we're going to show you today were bred and raised by hobbyists in Europe. These are really good, high quality stock, and we're going to start with this one. So this is the blue flame. It's an Agazizii type. So Agazizii has been in the hobby for a long time and there's all kinds of color morphs of them. This one's new to me though. It, it's been around a little while, but this is my first time having it ever. And I am blown away. Blue is right. Like the body, it reminds me of the color of like an electric blue German Ram or an electric blue Acara. Beautiful iridescent blue on the body, but then it still has the red tail and the typical kind of striping pattern on the tail that you get on the Agazizii. I think these guys are just fantastic. These are the ones, of all the fish we got in that shipment, we got a lot of epistos and a bunch of other stuff too. Several thousand fish. This is the one that keeps drawing my eye, and that's why I wanted to start this video here. Now, I looked into these. I wanted to get a sense of what their life is like in the wild. Now, these are many generations from the wild, just like a chihuahua is many generations away from a wolf. I think it's helpful to kind of visit the wild occasionally to get back in touch with where the fish comes from and what it needs. And what I was interested in is diet. And I came across a study that looked at the stomach contents of large numbers of Pistogramma agazizii. I looked at them in the forest, on the margin of the forest, in the grasslands, and in pastures once the land had been transitioned to cattle. The study was trying to see the effect of different environments on the diet. What they found is amalgamating the diets of all of those different locations, 58.89% of the diet was insect fragments, meaning they're eating insects. And when you open the stomach, you see little fragments because they've been chewed up. So they're eating a lot of insects. And then the second one, 37.95% is aquatic larva of flies. So that means 96.84% of the diet of Epistogramma agazizii in the wild is either insects or insect larva. Now there's another epistle we have in, let's go look at that, and they have a different diet in the wild. So let's go look at those. So this next species, this is Epistogramma urethura, not to be confused with urethra, which is what it sounds a lot like. Urethura means red tail, I believe. And these in the wild eat mostly crustaceans, little tiny crustaceans that look kind of like Daphne, pond crustaceans, basically. These come from Bolivia, and there's a picture of their habitat and a description of where they were collected. And it's basically a really slow flowing part of the river. It's basically a lake, really shallow and choked with aquatic vegetation, lots of plants everywhere. And these guys are just picking all these little crustaceans off of the plants. Um, I took some notes here. The temperature range in their natural habitat was 77 to 87 degrees. So quite a range. These guys, one thing we want to show you here is the difference between apistos with dither fish and apistos without. A lot of apistos, you don't have dither fish and they're out and about and they're fine. But there are species that are a little bit shy. So this is kind of what they're doing. They're all hanging around that log, right? You can tell they aren't quite comfortable. They're peeking out for food and things. I'm gonna actually lift that log up so we can get a really good shot of them. So see that bright red tail on those males? Like, look at this guy right here. That's the dominant male, I'm sure. Although they're still settling in and settling their hierarchy. So really pretty fish. But if you notice, they were all like in that wood and around that wood, not feeling secure quite yet. I think we're probably two days out from them just being out and about. This is another fish, is a pistogram of Banshai, one you don't see a lot. And these guys were super shy. And then a couple days ago, we just put in a group of super blue emperor carry tetras, and now they're out and about. So that's the difference with the dither fish. This is one I don't know as much about. This is my first time having these but uh, they're beautiful. They have a, a bright red margin on the tail. Really interesting, kind of unique looking epistogramma. So people often ask me how to breed epistos. I think a setup like this is how I would do it. I wouldn't have all the tetras in there, but if you have two pairs of epistos and you have a setup like this, then what's gonna happen if they're a pair bonding species is one pair will pick this side with all the wood and hardscape and caves Another pair will pick this side and they'll nest in there and they'll create their territories in there. 
And then in this middle, we just have some, some soft like plant material to kind of divide the territories. And what's gonna happen is this pair will constantly go to the middle about here where it's open and flare to that pair, which will also come over and they'll kind of go back and forth, but they'll have their own distinct territories. So they'll be able to spawn successfully and they'll kind of stay out of each other's business. At, at the border here, there'll be a lot of back and forth and a lot of defending, but in the actual territory itself, it'll be more or less secure. What happens then is the pair bond stays really strong. Wow, look how pretty she is. Look at that female above my finger. She is fired up and ready to spawn. Look at her. So she's getting that bright yellow gold coloration that's typical of an epistle female, but retaining her black stripes. That is beautiful. That's one of the prettiest female epistles I've ever seen. Holy cow. And then the males, as you can see, are, are I don't know, they remind me a little bit of a Panduro in that they have that red margin on the rounded caudal fin. Um, but I, I love these Banshee. First time I've ever had them. Unique Episto and looking awesome. But anyway, I've described this setup a lot of times in live streams. I often get the question, how would you set up a tank for Episto's to breed them? And I've described it many times, but we set this up so we could actually show you. This is how we would do it. All right, let's look at some other species. So this one is Epistogramma borelii, but this is the opal strain. So it's just kind of a, a different color morph really pretty fish. I think these are one of the, I'm going to say subtly beautiful epistos. They don't have bright gaudy colors, but the opals have some really nice yellows and the dorsal fin is nice and big. They call it the umbrella episto or umbrella cichlid oftentimes because the dorsal is so large. These come from a pretty wide area. I have a friend that went and collected them down in Uruguay and the places they collected them in would get like ice over the top in the winter. They collected them in water that was, I think it was around 50 degrees at the time they went and collected. So these have a wide temperature tolerance. If you have a patio pond or a, a tank out on your patio, these might be something you could keep outdoors year round. If you live in, you know, California or somewhere where it doesn't get super, super cold. We're not doing that here in Wyoming, but uh, out in Santa Barbara, it would have been perfect. Borrelii are a long loved fish. They've been around in the hobby for a long time just because they're pretty and they're hardy. And uh, again, they can take a wide range of temperatures. Great fish for a beginner. If you're starting Epistos, these might be more forgiving than some of the others. Not that any Episto that I've ever kept is what I would call delicate, as long as it's sourced correctly and acclimated correctly. These are kept in hard alkaline water. They're just taken care of and adjusted to that carefully and monitored carefully as they make that adjustment. The fact that they were bred and raised by hobbyists for several generations kind of helps. They aren't coming from a pH of 4.5 in the wild and suddenly now they're an 8.3 and trying to figure out what's going on. So, but in my experience, epistos are pretty hardy once they settle in, as long as they're sourced correctly, once they're acclimated to whatever they're going in, they're pretty bulletproof. All right, this here is a group of Epistogramma panduro. There's panduro and nisani that look very similar. And generally when you're buying these, a lot of suppliers, a lot of fish farms and things will kind of use the terms interchangeably. So you're never quite sure. But with these European hobbyists, they're pretty much sticklers for identification. So I'm confident saying these are the true Panduros. They've been rock solid. I have tried Panduro from several different suppliers in the past and it didn't go well. It was a lot of work to get them healthy. We had way heavier losses than we would have expected. So I'm gonna stick with this supplier for a while. Beautiful little fish. This one's near and dear to my heart because it's one of the first epistles I ever saw. Back when I was probably 13, 14 years old, I walked into my uh, godfather, Jim Forche's fish room for the first time. And he had a pair of these and a little, I think it was a 10 gallon. It might've been a little five and a half gallon tank with a little uh, ceramic cave. And the female was swimming in and out of the cave trying to entice the male to come in. And it was just, gorgeous. And that sight and this fish is stuck in my mind for 30 years. I love this fish. All right. This is another really hardy one. This is Epistogramma trifasciata. And the reason it's so hardy is it has a massive range from the Rio Guarapare. It's a river that runs along the Bolivian and Brazilian border. It is the border, actually. I think that that river all the way down to the Rio Paraná in Argentina through Paraguay all the way down, large range. The temperatures in Argentina, which I know well, I lived there for a few years, get really cold. And so 
These guys can take a wide temperature range as well. And any fish that has a really wide range tends to be a little easier to keep in our aquariums just because in the wild, it's adapted to lots of different things. But anyway, Trifasciata is a, a beautiful little fish. Don't see it very often. And I think it's another good one to start with if you're a beginner. Okay, another beautiful fish that has been in the hobby for a little while is Epistogramma Hongsloy. These are the red, beautiful red across the belly, just a spectacular looking fish, kind of steel blue on the body, yellow face. And there's another version of these that we have, which is the red gold. Let me show you those. These came in a little bigger. Basically the same thing, but the body color on these has a little more gold to it. This is my first time having these. We've only had them for about a week and a half, but I do see more gold on these than those uh, just reds there. So I can see the difference. Anyway, beautiful fish. Uh, I like all the versions of the Hongsley. It's just a really, really stunning Episto. And then back to the one that we missed over here. This is the McMaster Eye. Oh, I should be showing this. This is where we mark losses. So I'm happy to say no losses on these guys. Uh, they came in in really good shape. The Hongsley here looking good. Just curious. Yeah, nothing on the reds. So we did lose a couple of some species, but barely any. Like this supplier does a good job and they, they ship ethically as well. They don't overpack the fish. But this has been a favorite for a little while now, for a few months. This is the McMaster Eye. This is the red gold version. So it's got the bright gold body and the red shoulder. It's just a really neat mix of colors. We've uh, had several reports from customers that they're already spawning for them. So it appears they're a pretty easy one to spawn and raise. So if you want to get fingers wet with spawning Epistos, this is the one we get the most spawning reports on from our customers. So appears to be a good one to start with. And then I think we've got one more to end on. Let's take you over here and show you this fish. Here's a fish that most Episto keepers start with. This is Epistogramma cockatoides. Very common in the hobby, been around for a while. Lots of different color variants have been bred for this one. This is the double red. So it's got red in at least two fins, the dorsal fin and the caudal fin, tail fin. I always say caudal. It's a $5 word for tail. In this batch, doing fantastic, no losses. So they're thriving for us. I think they'll thrive for you. Again, all these Epistos that we're showing you were hobbyists bred and raised in Europe. So people that do a good job and have consistently done a good job for many decades and, and get us nice fish that are shipped in a humane manner. So I think it's a great source for us and uh, hopefully you'll think so too if you get any at dancefish.com, hint, hint. Anyway, I wanna take a moment to thank everybody that supports us. If you're a customer or someone that's active on the YouTube channel or spread the word about what we're doing here at Dance Fish to kind of change the narrative and improve the aquarium fish industry, we're very grateful. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, it's Dan. If you want to learn more about Aquarium Fish, we do a live stream every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Dan's Fish YouTube channel. If you're in the market for Aquarium Fish, check us out at dancefish.com. We ship to the U.S. and parts of Canada. And if you want something fishy to wear, we've got merch. Till next time, have a good one. Bye-bye.